So today I would like to talk to you about multi-wavelength surveys for active galactic nuclei. This is a talk that is being given at the IAU Symposium on Nuclear Activity in Galaxies Across Cosmic Time, being held in October 2019 in Ethiopia. So we have known for many years that active galactic nuclei benefit greatly from multi-wavelength surveys. They are arguably the most multi-wavelength sources there are out in the universe, and they emit substantially over 10 or more decades in frequency, as you can see from this broadband spectral energy distribution that I have plotted here. And the different multi-wavelength emissions that we see from active galactic nuclei probe all the different fascinating physical components of these systems, ranging from the accretion disk to the accretion disk corona, to jets, to uh, nuclear uh, obscuring dust, to uh, in some cases outflows, and so on. And for the 75 year history of active galaxy studies, I would argue that most of what we know about active galactic nuclei has been driven or at the least strongly shaped by our methods for finding them. And the whole industry of multi-wavelength AGN surveys has been an enormous success. I've been involved in the, this, this enterprise for about 20 years now. And there's been enormous successes just over the 25 years that I've been fortunate to be able to witness directly. And uh, these range from uh, directly now being able to measure the contributions of active galactic nuclei to the various cosmic backgrounds. We have now revealed most or at least much of the obscured supermassive black hole growth in the universe. Um, we have uh, totally changed our understanding of AGN evolution with the realization that AGNs follow a cosmic downsizing type behavior. And that has important um, consequences for the so-called cosmic balance of power between how much energy uh, has been um, produced in galaxies by the supermassive black holes relative to all the stars in those galaxies. We also have achieved a much better understanding of high redshift active galaxies and their contributions to cosmic reionization. And we've also now are making strong progress on the connections between AGNs and galaxies more generally, as well as between AGNs and, and cosmic large scale structures. And so all of those things are, are, are a pretty good thing to achieve, I would say, over the past uh, 20 years. Um, so the outline for my talk is the following. I'd like to start with some brief introductory points. I would then like to move on to talk about some of the current surveys and their results. And I will then end by talking about some future prospects for multi-wavelength AGN surveys. And I'll start with these, some, the, these brief introductory points. So to begin with, just a couple of quick warnings or, or apologies. First of all, multi-wavelength AGN surveys is a truly enormous field. All of those great achievements I just talked about are the work of a large number of people working across the electromagnetic spectrum. And so it will be impossible in this talk to be fully complete. In fact, there are, there are many detailed review articles. I'll give references to some of those at the end of my talk, as well as entire conferences. And I've shown a few examples of those here, um, you know, focused on this issue of multi-wavelength AGN surveys. And indeed, there are thousands of papers in their literature uh, on this topic. So I will, again, only be scratching the surface of this massive field. And moreover, I'm only going to aim to give some of the main ideas, and I will also be aiming to keep this coverage accessible to students who are just trying to learn this material for the first time. Uh, my apologies in advance if your favorite work is not covered. And of course, other speakers at this conference will be covering more aspects of, of this enterprise, especially focusing on the many great science results, which I will not be able to cover in much detail here. Um, so to begin with then, uh, I think that searching for active galactic nuclei in a multi-wavelength way, using multiple different methods, is extremely important. 
And there have been you know, many methods developed for finding AGN, some as old as the, the subject itself, uh, going back to a mission line selection back in 1943 by, by Carl Seyfert, through to the work by Martin Schmidt discovering quasars in 1963. And one thing that the multi-wavelength approaches have certainly shown is that all of the methods that we've devised for finding AGNs out in the universe have their limitations and their selection effects. And it's absolutely critical to understand these uh, and to understand the extent to which the survey that you're conducting is influencing your ability to make broader conclusions about the AGM population as a whole. Um, I would say that there are some methods that give more complete and purer samples of active galactic nuclei than others, and I'll talk about the various methods soon. Um, and for a complete census then, as I've said, um, it is extremely valuable to employ mul as multiple methods, in fact, as many methods as possible, so you can cross-check your selection approaches against each other, and it's only by employing all those methods together and using them all together to cross-check and improve each other that we can get a full census of the AGN population out in the universe um, and fully understand the sources that, that we detect. And, and I would say that, that now um, multi-wavelength surveys of AGNs have progressed to a point where our current census of the AGM population is sufficient to answer many of the key questions that we have about this, um, this, this class of sources out in the universe. Okay, so let's uh, just go through another, a few other quick issues. One, one thing I, will, I want to mention is that it is common in surveys for active galactic nuclei, as well as surveys more generally, to adopt a wedding cake design for these surveys. And the idea here is you conduct a bunch of different surveys that are layered in increasing depth but ever decreasing area, ranging from very wide field surveys to medium field surveys to deep field surveys. And an example of that is shown over here in this plot of flux limit versus solid angle for, for X-ray surveys for active galactic nuclei. We have some very deep field surveys and then we have some medium field surveys and we have some wide field surveys. And all those surveys together, following this wedding cake design, uh, is what is, enables us to get a complete understanding of, of the AGM population. You need the deep and the medium and the wide all together to properly explore AGM discovery space. Um, another point I wanna make is that AGNs span an enormous range of, of luminosity. Here is just one example of that. This is a, a plot that shows um, a set of active galactic nuclei ordered by luminosity. Here they're, they're plotting the X-ray to optical flux ratio, but the details of, of the Y-axis, in fact, aren't, aren't what's essential here. The, the point I want to stress is you can see that active galactic nuclei are found ranging from low luminosity AGNs through to the moderate luminosity AGNs, sometimes referred to as the safer type active galaxies, through to the, the powerful quasars. And altogether, the population is spanning like nine plus orders of, of magnitude in, in luminosity. And in fact, there is no obvious strict lower limit on luminosity. You know, the galactic center shows some fascinating signs of activity at a very modest level. And so, um, in fact, what you call an active galactic nucleus and whether you distinguish that from the normal galaxy population ultimately becomes almost a, a, a semantic question. But it's clear that there's an enormous range of luminosities uh, among the, the active galactic nuclei. I, I would say that we do think that we have found, you know, with all these intensive surveys that we've now done, we do think that we found about the upper limit of you know, active galactic nucleus power. That is, we don't think that if we keep surveying for another 20 years with ever improved surveys, we will somehow discover a new class of active galactic nuclei that's 100 times more powerful than the most powerful ones that we found already. We think now we've surveyed the universe well enough that we found pretty well the examples of the most powerful active galactic nuclei that are out there. But who knows? Maybe we'll have a, a wonderful surprise waiting for us in that regard. Um, uh, and... Given that the, the, the AGN show this enormous uh, diversity of, of just of luminosities, it's pretty clear that no single survey method is going to be able to work perfectly across the, this enormous range of luminosity. Um, another point I want to make, kind of related to the previous one, then, is that host galaxies 
are you know an, a, a, um, a a persistent challenge to the selection of active galactic nuclei and that's especially true down at low luminosities and at large distances here are three just examples of a, a low luminosity active galactic nucleus a sort of medium luminosity active galactic nucleus and then, and then a powerful quasar and while in the case of a powerful quasar the um, light from the accreting black hole outshines the light of the host galaxy for the majority population of active galactic nuclei the more moderate luminosity systems host galaxies are contributing to the total light from the system often at a, a very substantial level and especially when you're trying to survey the, the very distant universe where you don't have the luxury of being able to go in and do a high quality job spatially resolving the nucleus from the, the overall host galaxy, there can be real challenges there in terms of separating out light from the active nucleus compared to light from the host galaxy. Um, and then furthermore, I just want to mention that um, AGN appearances can be deceiving. Um, so what I mean by that is when you go and find an active galactic nucleus and you try to assess what it is, how powerful it is, for example, um, you, if, unless you're very careful, it's possible to get the answer quite wrong in many cases. And, th and that's true for, for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, we know that there is a, uh, often a kind of anisotropic obscuration present in active galactic nuclei. This is sometimes referred to as the the famous obscuring torus that is thought to be present in, in many active galactic nuclei, as shown in this little schematic here. And, and in fact, we now know from um, you know the X-ray surveys and the infrared surveys, for example, that, that in fact most of the active galactic nuclei in the universe are obscured. And so this, this obscuration issue is, is a big deal, and you have to be very careful when assessing uh, your survey of an active galactic, your survey of, of active galactic nuclei, the extent to which this, this obscuration may be affecting your results. I will also just mention that you can have anisotropic obscuration from, from other things, uh, from an, an outflow from the active galactic nucleus, for example, or uh, the accretion disk itself in some cases may actually obscure some of the light from the very central regions, and so that can actually cause um, you know, anisotropy as, as well. Furthermore, um, in, in some cases, the, the active galactic nuclei themselves emit strongly anisotropically. Uh, the most famous example of that is the case of blazars, as shown in this little schematic here, where you have a powerful jet shining directly at Earth in this case. And, and here, um, if you just measure the luminosity as it appears, and multiply by four pi, excuse, excuse me, the flux as it appears, and multiply by you know, four pi times the distance squared, then you'll get a very wrong estimate of what the true luminosity of the system is. You would be greatly overestimating it in, in, in that case. Uh, we also know that accretion disks themselves likely have some significant degree of anisotropy, and, and that has to be borne in mind as well. Okay, so those were my sort of quick um, introductory points and now I just want to launch into the current surveys and their results and I'm going to break this up into ground-based surveys and then space-based surveys and I'll, I'll explain why momentarily. So let's start with the, the ground-based surveys. So um, the atmospheric windows you know that, that allow observations from the Earth's surface um, you know allow very effective observations in, in certain uh, wave bands. And you can see that here. We have, of course, the, the famous optical window, and then there are these um, near-infrared and mid-infrared bands uh, where you can sometimes uh, see through the atmosphere. And then, of course, there's the, the very broad and important radio window. And um, data in these atmospheric windows can be obtained relatively economically from the ground. And, and that's, that's very important. Um, that allows observations made in, in those bands to, for example, benefit quickly from this relentless and, and wonderful growth that we've had in information technology, uh, whereby you know, new improved detectors are, are developed and can be rapidly deployed on ground-based facilities, which is much more challenging for, for a space-based mission. Or furthermore, this gives you the ability to uh, re record enormous volumes of data and move that data around effectively. Um, that, that is all possible um, you know, on, on a short time scale 
uh, it's possible to utilize that, 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 that enormous growth in information technology on a short time scale in, in these ground-based windows. And for that reason, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, most active galactic nuclei have in fact been found in those ground-based um, bands. Um, and you can see that here just with, with two examples. Here is a plot that shows a selection of optical imaging surveys showing here the, the magnitude limit with more sensitive surveys toward the top versus the solid angle. And you can see again the, the wedding cake design here of, of optical imaging surveys. And these have been extremely effective altogether in probing the, the AGN population and generating enormous numbers of active galactic nuclei. And, and then you know, and hand in hand with the optical imaging surveys are, for example, the optical spectroscopic surveys. And there's been large numbers of those as well. And those are absolutely essential for you know, identifying the AGNs that, that are in um, the optical imaging surveys. Um, and so how do we select active galaxies from, from optical imaging surveys? Well, it, first of all, in, in optical imaging surveys, you are mainly looking at the AGN light from the, the accretion disk. You will also sometimes have contributions from emission line regions. And so one standard approach is to utilize the fact that the accretion disk tends to be quite bright in the, the blue and the ultraviolet. So you look for sources that are brighter in the ultraviolet than normal stars, as shown in this little diagram here. That works pretty well out to ratios of two to two and a half. And, and these methods work best for unobscured quasars. Um, and you can see that here. It, an unobscured quasar stands out quite obviously via this ultraviolet excess relative to, for example, stars which, had a, which have a comparable brightness in the visible. And so for unobscured active galactic nuclei, this blue continuum is obviously visible, and you can home in on it and use that to select active galactic nuclei. And, and this little panel over here on the right, in fact, is, is uh, showing you know, color selection of, of um, one type. Here, here, for example, are plots of G minus R, U minus G, R minus I, and so on. And you can see that you can select active galactic nuclei using multiple colors. And in fact, as you go to higher redshifts, um, the absorption by the IGM comes in and starts to play a substantial role. And that makes quasars appear very red in, in the blue part of the spectrum because all of their, their, their red light is getting absorbed by intergalactic material. And so you can discriminate them again via these colors. And so active galactic nuclei can be very effectively selected when you have multiple colors available. And um, then moreover, if you can extend your coverage out to the, the uh, near infrared bands, that furthermore helps in terms of the, let, that lets you home in on uh, reddened AGNs in many cases, which would otherwise might be hard to find. And it also lets you extend your, your color base selection out to very high redshifts. If you add near infrared data, that allows you to extend your selections out to redshifts of six and beyond, even up to now more than seven, okay? Um, so, so this is one very effective method of selecting active galactic nuclei. And this has been a, an enormous uh, workhorse method for, for many years. Um, I would also just mention briefly that this works best at, at high luminosities. Clearly, as you go to lower AGM luminosities, host galaxy light can become problematic. And I'll say more about that in a little bit. So here is an example then of the success of optical color selection. This is the, the flood of quasars that have come from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has used optical and near infrared color selection now with great effectiveness over about a quarter of the sky. And here is a plot, which is very impressive, which shows the number of SDSS quasars versus time over a 16 year period. And you can see Sloan has just continually grown and grown and grown and grown. And here there was an uptick with, with um, Sloan 3 and Sloan 4 where they're generating huge numbers of quasars. We're now up to, well, more than 500,000 quasars. And I, I know they actually have many more that, that have yet to been, be publicly released. There'll be several hundred thousand more coming soon. And all of these quasars in this case have been spectroscopically confirmed. So these again are color selected quasars. They've now been spectroscopically confirmed. And again, I mean, it's hard to argue with that. I mean, that's an enormous sample that, that color selection has allowed us to, um, you know, generate and uh, lots of fantastic science has been done with that AGN sample. Um, this plot here shows the um, 
sort of luminosity uh, redshift distribution for those uh, Sloan quasars. You can see they span a, a pretty broad range now of the luminosity redshift plane. And here is uh, just a plot showing the, 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 the redshift range. And you see they've done pretty well all the way from fairly low redshifts through now up to redshifts of even above four just with this standard color selection. And then of course, by utilizing additional data, they've been able to, with Sloan, extend their selection out to redshifts of five. And well, in fact, Sloan data alone could get you up to five, but, but they've been able to extend it out to redshifts of six and beyond by utilizing additional uh, observations. Okay, so that's the Sloan quasar flood is just one example of the success of color selection. But there also are other ways to select um, active galactic nuclei uh, in, in, in the optical, you can utilize emission line selection. Uh, you can exploit the strong emission lines um, of, of AGNs to, to aid their identification. Here is an example where people have conducted the Homburg Quasar Survey utilizing a transmission grading and a prism, a so-called grism, to make these spectroscopic images on the sky. And they found many highly luminous quasars with that approach. Uh, another example right now is there's a large blind spectroscopic survey called HETDEX that's undergoing that's ongoing with a Hobby Everly telescope. It's going to survey a substantial fraction of the sky with this massive blind spectroscopic survey and we'll find many AGNs from, from the emission line selection technique. Okay. Furthermore, one can utilize variability selection. We've known for a long time that, that AGNs vary. Here is a hundred year B band light curve of, of 3C273. And so you can select active galactic nuclei based on their variability, which has a distinctive character to it. And here, here's uh, one recent example of that. This is work by Demetra DeChico, where she has utilized um, optical variability selection to identify, to, to test the effectiveness of optical variability selection versus the X-ray based selection technique for active galaxies in, in the cosmos field. And using data from the, the VST, they have been able to reach um, down to like 23rd and a half magnitude. And they find that all, many of these objects, which have large RMS deviations above the general source population and, and the threshold level that's shown down here, are found to be active galactic nuclei. And they have now reached a, um, a sky density via the variability selection technique of something like 256 per square degree. And, you know, when you have something like LSST operating, if you can just do as well as they do, uh, you can get up to like 4.6 4 million active galactic nuclei, and, and you can quite likely get many more than that. And I'll say more about that later. Um, it will, and so this, this, this approach of variability selection will become ever more important, I would say, as, um, as we continue to have this explosion of future, and, well, and, ongoing um, wide field time domain surveys. We should generate enormous numbers of active galactic nuclei via such techniques. Okay, um, and the optical and near infrared selection techniques have also found many fascinating examples of exceptional quasars. I can't go through all of them. I'll just point out two uh, nice um, types of examples here. Uh, we have found large numbers of heavily reddened quasars. This is work by uh, Mander, Manda Banerjee and, and colleagues where utilizing the, the near-infrared data, they can go and select, as I mentioned, even heavily reddened um, type 1 quasars out in the distant universe. And you can see here that the near-infrared data allow you to home in on such systems. And many of these systems are, are extremely powerful. Uh, here's another example. Uh, and this one comes from essentially a mission line-based selection, where just Sloan has taken so many spectra of remarkable objects of various types. If you go and just trawl through the massive Sloan spectroscopic database, you can spectroscopically select type two quasars um, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And, and here is a nice composite from, from work by uh, Yuan and Michael Strauss and, and, and co um, showing um, 2,756 quasars here um, co-added together. And you can see the beautiful um, type two emission line spectrum they found from all these quasars. And these quasars have, these type two quasars in this case have been found up to, you know, moderately high redshifts. And again, there are many other uh, fascinating examples of exceptional AGNs. I'm just laying out two of them here for, for your broad interest. Okay, so now I want to move on to radio surveys for active galactic nuclei. And, and radio surveys for active galactic nuclei are very powerful in their own regime. Um, at high radio luminosities, 
uh, we are mainly looking at AGN light from the jets. And that's on a wide range of time scales, extending all the way down to very small time size, down to very small size scales, which one often refers to as, as the core. And um, we know that almost all luminous radio sources that you find up on the sky turn out to be active galactic nuclei. And so if you just go out and do a, a relatively low sensitivity survey in the radio on the sky, the vast majority of what you're going to find are active galactic nuclei, which is a, makes it a very good way of selecting these systems, or at least some of these systems. Um, furthermore, modern radio surveys generally have high sensitivity, they provide good source positions, which is very important to get counterparts. And they also provide useful and fascinating morphological information, as you can see here on these active AGN jets. And so there's been a large number of radio surveys that have been conducted. This is a, from a nice review by, by Norris that shows here, again, uh, that, that sort of wedding cake survey design. Uh, uh, in this case, areas on this axis and limiting sensitivities on, on this axis. But you can see that there's been large numbers of radio surveys that have been conducted over the years, as well as a number of very exciting ongoing and, and future surveys uh, plotted over here. And um, this has been a very successful method. Um, I would say, however, that radio surveys generally do have high incompleteness to the overall population of active galactic nuclei because we know that only about 10% of active galactic nuclei have the, the very high radio luminosities, okay, that lets um, the, these systems be selected easily as active galactic nuclei. Now, it certainly is the case that, that radio quiet active galactic nuclei do have some radio emission, and in fact, there have been entire conferences just on the radio emission from radio quiet active galactic nuclei. Here is a plot from, from one of those conferences. Um, and, you know, the, the emission, the source of the emission from, from radio emission from radio quiet AGNs likely has a, a variety of origins. It, it may include, in some cases, emission from a, a small jet. Uh, some people believe that the corona may contribute some radio emission. Star formation may also contribute to the radio emission, or, or you may have a wind um, that produces some of the radio emission. In fact, people are still debating the, the, the detailed origin of the um, radio emission from radio quiet AGNs, and you can read this review by Panessa Adal that, that, that describes some of that. But in any case, um, again, while the radio quiet AGNs do have some radio emission from these various sources, it is weak, and, and that makes um, searches for this radio quiet majority population of active galactic nuclei challenging in the radio band because as you go down to the very faint radio limits you need to find these radio quiet agents you also start to detect large numbers of additional sources in particular large numbers of star forming galaxies are detected and it's challenging to separate out which of the radio sources you've detected down at low flex levels are star forming galaxies versus are um, radio quiet agents. Now it can be done often by employing multi-wavelength data, but it is a challenge and it's difficult to implement on a truly massive scale across large stretches of the sky, at least presently because you know the multi-wavelength data over those very wide fields um, is just isn't there yet to enable that to be done effectively, although I think it will be there in the future. Um, a few other points about radio selected active galactic nuclei. I mean an obvious question which has been around you know, ever since we started understanding active galactic nuclei is why is it the case that, you know, 10% of active galactic nuclei learn this trick that allows them to launch powerful relativistic jets and be uh, luminous radio sources, whereas 90% of the active galactic nuclei are radio quiet. Um, that is still not fundamentally understood. Lots of people have lots of good ideas and strong opinions, but I, at least in my opinion, um, that that matter is still uh, fairly unclear. Um, it could be due to supermassive black hole spin. It could be due to uh, Eddington ratio effects. Uh, it could be due to environments, or it could be due to a combination of those things, and people are still trying to, to understand that. Um, a few other points. First of all, the, the, the radio, radio emission that we see from active galactic nuclei typically shows a, a power loss spectrum. It's mostly uh, synchrotron, uh, emission, uh, sometimes with synchrotron self-absorption being present. And unfortunately, the, the radio 
spectrum by itself typically does not provide you with any high precision, at least, re uh, redshift information. So that, that's one challenge is, you know, you don't have automatic redshifts. You have to go and follow up the radio sources optically before you can um, determine, you know, their distances, their luminosities, and so on. Uh, furthermore, um, radio selected active black nuclei are often affected by beaming. For example, in the case of blazars that I mentioned, where you can have a powerful relativistic jet pointed um, almost right along your line of sight that can greatly boost the strength of the radio emission relative to what a truly isotropic source would appear like. And so that is a major complication in trying to interpret um, radio uh, source populations when, when you conduct a survey. Now, people have gotten very good at, at unwinding those things, but it still remains a, a frequent challenge. And then, um, furthermore, another big positive aspect of radio surveys is they often are, well, that they generally are, are not significantly dust extincted. Um, and you, know, you can sometimes have free, free absorption of radio emission, but in general, they don't suffer from significant extinction. And that, that's, a, that's another big advantage of radio surveys. Um, a, a remarkable point then is that when you go out and do radio surveys, you find that most luminous radioactive galactic nuclei lack prominent AGN signatures in, for example, the optical. They don't show, an, in many cases, a, a strong discontinuum. Uh, they often don't show obvious, strong, broad lines. And so this is a just one key example of how different selection methods often find different AGM populations. And it, the idea here is that analogous to, to this picture of, of many different uh, blind people, in this case, you know, inspecting an elephant. And, you know, this person feels the elephant's tail and thinks that the elephant is like a rope. This person feels the side of the elephant. It feels like the elephant is like a wall and so on. This person feels the elephant's ear and thinks that an elephant is like a rug. This person feels the elephant's tusk and feels like an elephant's like a sphere. But of course, each one of them is only measuring one aspect of an elephant. And you need all of these different uh, measurements together to get a complete picture of what an elephant actually is. And so that, that's the point I, I'm trying to drive at here. Again, that, that different selection methods often find different AGM populations, and you really need a multi-wavelength approach to get a complete picture of, of what active galactic nuclei are, are like. And this basic point um, is one key reason why AGN terminology is a mess. People started off measuring active galactic nuclei in their various different wavelength regimes. Each one was measuring a part of an active galactic nucleus. And they came up with their own terminology to describe the things that they were finding, but they didn't have a complete picture. And you know, today, in retrospect, if we could go back, we surely could come up with a more um, logically organized uh, terminology for active galactic nuclei. But the various terminology has already caught on. It's too late, and so um, you, you might as well just go ahead and learn it because I don't think there's there are real prospects for, for improving the situation at this point. We're just too far down the river to, to, to go back. Okay, so now I want to move on and talk some about space-based surveys. Okay, and, and this will include surveys in the, in the high energy, the far and mid-infrared, and, and the infrared. And so here, of course, space missions allow you to get up above the atmosphere, where the atmosphere would otherwise prevent observations. And, um, you know, that allows, that opens up fundamentally important additional windows to explore. Now, there are some challenges there. Of course, space missions are, are very expensive. <clears throat> um, it is hard to launch something up above, you know, up into orbit. It is hard to, um, you know, develop uh, detectors and such that are sufficiently radiation hardened to survive uh, the rigors of, of the space environment. And, and so for that re for those reasons, uh, the technology on space missions has tended to lag ground-based technology. Again, uh, on the ground, you can take these wonderful advances in information technology and deploy them very rapidly to make new astronomical observations. Where in space, there tends to be more of a lag in, in that regard. And as one example of that, I will, I will just point you to the, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which is one of my personal favorite missions um, and has been enormously successful. It has conducted all these wonderful X-ray surveys down to great sensitivities. 
for example. But um, if you look at Chandra's collecting area, Chandra's collecting area is between, you know, in round numbers, like 300 to 600 square centimeters. That's about the size of a dinner plate. Okay, so, you know, all those wonderful surveys have been conducted with um, a facility that, that ha only collects about as much light as you would get from, you know, the size of a dinner plate. And so that um, presents, um, you know, limitation. That shows you how challenging it is, for example, to operate up, up in space. Um, now, that being said, these um, space-based surveys offer fantastic advantages, advantages that are so important that it's worth going to all the trouble of building uh, these expensive and very challenging space missions and, and executing them because they open up such important additional views of active galactic nuclei that it's almost inconceivable that, that you wouldn't do it. Uh, the, the results from these space missions have been so important that it's absolutely essential to, to, to do it. Okay, so let's now talk then about some of these uh, space-based surveys. I'm gonna start with X-ray surveys, which are particularly dear to my heart. Um, X-ray surveys are an extremely important way of studying active galactic nuclei. They have a number of key advantages. Uh, first of all, um, the X-ray mission that, that we observe from this accretion disk corona and sometimes from, from jets is nearly universal. That is, we believe that almost all active galactic nuclei emit substantial X-ray emission. Um, sometimes that emission can be obscured, but often it is not. And that brings me to, to point number two. Point number two is that X-ray emission is known to be highly penetrating. We know that from the doctor's office or the dentist's office. And, and thus, um, X-ray emission has low obscuration bias. And, and that is shown by this little schematic here where I'm showing a broadband uh, X-ray spectrum of an active galactic nucleus. I'm adding different amounts of absorption to it. This is the absorption column density of hydrogen labeled there. And you can see, particularly for high energy X-rays, they can penetrate through large amounts of obscuration um, with, with, with minimal effects. And, and to give you a, a sense here, a column density of about 10 to the 23 is comparable to the column density through your hand. A column density of 10 to the 24 is comparable to the column density through your chest. And so you can see that hard X-rays are minimally affected even by very large column densities. Uh, absorption levels that would wipe out optical emission, for example, X-rays can straightforwardly get through. And that's a very important aspect of X-ray emission. And then finally, as you can see from this little schematic down here, X-rays um, have generally low dilution by host galaxy starlight. That is, an, this is an optical image of a nearby active galactic nucleus. And you can see all the, all the wonderful starlight that's there, but that starlight unfortunately competes with the light from the active galactic nucleus. Whereas in the X-ray band, all the starlight drops out. You just see the, the X-ray source with minimal uh, competition by, by host galaxy starlight. Okay, so let's now talk about some, some of these X-ray surveys. Um, I wanna talk both about deep and, and wide X-ray surveys. Here is an example of a, a very deep X-ray survey. This in fact is the very deepest astrogalactic X-ray survey that's ever been done. It's the center of the, the Chandra deep field south where there's now a seven million second observation with the, the Chandra X-ray observatory. And you can see all these X-ray sources here, and a large fraction of those sources are active galactic nuclei. Uh, we also have conducted a lot of wide field X-ray surveys. Here is the famous ROSAT All Sky Survey, which surveyed the entire sky to very good sensitivity in the 0 0.5 to 2 kV band. And um, we now, of course, have eRosita up and operating, which will provide a substantially higher sensitivity survey of the entire sky while also extending up to somewhat higher energies than, than, than Rose had achieved. So that's, that's very exciting right now. Um, <clears throat> at even higher energies, here is the, the Swift Bat 105 month all sky survey. And this is in the 14 to 195 kV band. And up there, they've detected large numbers of active galactic nuclei, including many obscured systems that would be hard to find down at lower X-ray energies. Now, now one point I, I wanna stress here is that I want you to I want to point out that X-rays span a very broad band. We're talking about a band running here from well down to like half a kV up to like 200 kV. Okay, that that's an incredibly broad band. And in fact, you know, ROSAT here, low energy X-rays, and Swift Bat up here are about as different as the the mid infrared 
and the ultraviolet in terms of the, the range of wavelengths or frequencies being covered. So the X-ray band is enormously broad. There's an enormous amount of information in it. And, and sometimes that is forgotten by people who just think that X-rays is a single thing. X-rays, again, span as much of the electromagnetic spectrum as the entire mid-infrared out to the ultraviolet. And it's worth bearing that in mind. Okay, there, there have been so many wonderful X-ray surveys. I just want to show a few other beautiful e examples here. And um, then, then a, a few additional points about X-ray surveys. So multi-wavelength comparisons show that X-ray surveys, particularly above 2 kV, are extremely efficient at selecting active galactic nuclei with high purity. That is, when you, when you home in on a source that you think is an active galactic nuclei via the X-ray selection technique, you're almost always right. Um, that's very important. There are other approaches, infrared, for example, where the purity is not nearly as high. Um, and ultra-deep X-ray surveys provide the highest AGN sky density at any wavelength. And, and that's shown here from this nice review paper by Padovani. It shows the largest AGN surface density found in the radio versus the near-infrared versus the X-ray versus the gamma ray and so on. And you can see right now X-rays are well in the lead. Okay, um, The sky densities that we find in the very deepest X-ray surveys indicate that there's about a billion active galactic nuclei over the entire sky that are still out there to be detected and studied. Um, okay, so, uh, another point I just want to make about X-ray surveys is that X-ray spectroscopic redshifts are rare. Similar to the radio, in most cases, um, X-rays do not give you a high precision redshift. So you typically need optical or near-infrared spectroscopic redshifts or photometric redshifts to, again, measure the distances to these sources and uh, derive luminosities and so on. And that is a persistent rate limiting step and a challenge for, for X-ray surveyors. Now, there are cases where you can sometimes see an X-ray emission line. The iron K alpha line is often used and people more recently have developed other approaches utilizing absorption cutoffs as ways to estimate redshifts. These do work to some degree. They provide very valuable initial information, but if you want high precision, highly reliable redshifts, you typically have to go out and just do the work and get optical near infrared spectroscopic redshifts, which can be an enormous job because many of these X-ray sources can often be quite faint. Okay, now I want to move on quickly to, to gamma ray surveys. Uh, gamma ray surveys, um, you know, broaden our multi-wavelength band, our multi-wavelength coverage of active galactic nuclei by an additional seven decades in frequency above the X-rays. And, and that's what's shown here. Here is uh, the sort of cutoff at 150 kV, just in round numbers between the highest energy X-ray surveys and where gamma ray surveys tend to take over. And you can see there's an additional enormous seven decades in frequency being covered uh, in the gamma rays. Uh, and in the gamma rays, you um, are mostly detecting jet-linked emission from a, this rare subset of active galactic nuclei that have jets that happen to be pointed at Earth, the so-called blazars. And here is a, a nice uh, recent result from the Fermi Large Area Telescope eight-year source catalog, where they have been now surveying the sky for well eight years in this case, and have detected something like 3,100 plus gamma ray emitting blazars. All of these white circles here are the gamma ray emitting blazars detected by Fermi in the sort of 50 MeV up to one TeV band. So Fermi's been an enormous success in generating lots of fascinating blazars. Um, furthermore, um, we now have even higher energy gamma ray instruments. Here's just one example. Um, the, 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 the Hess instrument, which covers sort of 0.1 up to 100 TeV. Uh, and it, this extends our coverage of the gamma ray spectrum to even higher energies. Um, and um, again, so you mostly detect these gamma ray blazars. Uh, sometimes you also detect some, some radio galaxies and other radio loud AGNs, but that's typically what you find uh, from the gamma ray surveys that have been done so far. Now, while these surveys are, are great and have found fascinating extreme objects, they do have rather severe incompleteness if you're trying to get a complete census of the overall AGN population out of the universe. So unfortunately, they are, are rather poor for surveys of the general AGN content of the universe. But the sources that you do find, again, are, are fascinating. They point the way to extreme jet physics. And again, they are sometimes detected over uh, an amazing 18 decades in frequency, which is quite spectacular. They are the ultimate in multi-wavelength 
um, AGN source. Okay, um, now I'll move on and talk briefly about mid-infrared and, and far-infrared surveys of, of AGNs. Uh, in the, in the mid-infrared and far-infrared, you are typically looking at dust, uh, and that dust can be heated either by the active galactic nucleus, when uh, light from the central source shines upon this torus and heats it up, for example, that can produce um, some of the, the infrared emission that typically is more important at the shorter infrared wavelengths. And then as you go out to longer infrared wavelengths, you start to also get a significant amount of infrared emission coming from stars uh, in, in the galaxy. And that's a very useful thing because that lets you go out and measure, for example, the rate at which stars are forming in um, some active galactic nuclei. Um, the, the, the basic point here, however, is you typically aren't observing direct emission from the, the core of the active galactic nucleus. You're rather observing waste heat, where radiation from the central source has shined out upon some other material, been absorbed, and been reprocessed and re-radiated out as, as waste heat. And so here is the, the broad infrared band. Again, at shorter infrared wavelengths, you often see the hot dust from the torus. As you go to longer infrared wavelengths, you typically see star formation, but it all, in the end, is, is typically waste heat. Um, and, and again, people have done a number of these very effective surveys. Here is a, a schematic uh, showing, uh, the, again, the, the flux density versus the, the solid angle coverage for, for Spitzer surveys at, at four and a half microns, ranging from lots, well, lots of Spitzer surveys, as well as uh, WISE is also included here. Um, and here is uh, a, a similar diagram shown out at 100 microns um, from, from the Herschel surveys. Okay, so that, that, that's a selection of the infrared surveys that have been conducted and used to study active galactic nuclei. And um, mid-infrared selection of active galactic nuclei um, has proved to be very effective in, in, in its own regime. Um, people have gone and developed various color selection recipes combining together different infrared bands to home in on active galactic nuclei, for, for example, in sensitive mid-infrared data. Here is a plot from the, the WISE folks, um, and this shows uh, you know, the difference between the 3.4 and 4.6 micron bands and the 4.6 and 12 micron bands, and people have found that active galactic nuclei preferentially live in certain parts of this diagram, and they have come up with various uh, recipes, or sometimes they call them wedges in this diagram that they use to select active galactic nuclei, and, and those have been very effective. Um, <clears throat> infrared mission also has a, the, the major advantage of being relatively obscuration free, especially at wavelengths beyond about six microns, uh, the emission from active galactic nuclei, type ones versus type twos, is quite isotropic. Um, and moreover, uh, infrared selection, in fact, has sometimes even found highly obscured active galactic nuclei that were missed even in very sensitive X-ray surveys. And that's a significant achievement, in my opinion. Um, however, ultimately, since you are studying the waste heat um, from these systems and you're not observing light from the direct um, core of the active nucleus, uh, you often do suffer from contamination by star-forming galaxies. These various selection approaches that people have come up with do often work quite well, um, especially some of the more conservative ones, but um, you, you do nevertheless often get additional non-AGN dominated systems, star-forming galaxies frequently coming in and, and contaminating the population of sources that you've selected um, that you initially thought were, were active galactic nuclei. That especially becomes important down at, at low and moderate AGN luminosities. And so thus, unlike X-ray based selection, which again is extremely pure in generating highly reliable samples, infrared selection, while it is very effective, um, it is often not very pure. Now often you can go clean up those infrared samples by combining the infrared data with multi-wavelength data, and, and that's an extremely important thing to do. Hence my earlier comments about the importance of having many different uh, surveys that you use to test and improve and cross-check each other. Okay, and, and there have been fantastic results from, from mid-infrared surveys. Here is a very impressive uh, recent result where the, the WISE satellite folks have now selected something like four and a half million active galactic nuclei across the sky with the WISE survey, and they estimate that those AGNs uh, have a 90% reliability 
down to fairly faint magnitudes. Here you can see are the I-band distribution, the H-band distribution, J and KS distribution, down to quite faint magnitudes now. They can get a highly reliable sample, or at least quite reliable sample, of active galactic nuclei. They, in fact, have an even larger sample if you go down to a lower level of reliability. And um, anyway, that, that is a, a very impressive, large sample of active galactic nuclei that, that mid-infrared selection has enabled. Furthermore, um, mid-infrared selection has found some, some uh, you know, spectacular objects. It has found, for example, these ultra-luminous so-called hot dust obscured galaxies, or sometimes they're called hot dogs, which I find to be rather embarrassing, but, but that is what the new term they use. And um, th these systems appear to have such high luminosities and, and have other characteristics that indicate that they very likely are highly obscured active galactic nuclei, at least in many cases. And, and that ha now has been confirmed to, to some degree via the X-ray uh, surveys um, where people have now studied um, the, these hot dust obscured galaxies in the X-ray band, and you often can find, indeed, signatures of, of X-ray AGNs in there. There have been other confirmations as well, where people have done uh, spectropolarimetric studies, people have just done optical spectroscopic studies revealing AGNs are there. And the overall story here is that a, a remarkable population of highly obscured um, systems at very high luminosities have been found from the mid-infrared selection approaches. Okay, so now I want to end by talking about some future prospects. And uh, I'll start just by laying out a few big questions, in my opinion, that remain for AGN surveys. One big thing where I still think a lot of work is still needed is to understand the growth and feedback of highly obscured supermassive black holes through the, the sort of redshift one to four era of at least massive galaxy formation. That is something that is uh, where I think we, we, we're starting to get the elements of a consistent story, but where I think a lot, a lot of further work is needed. Uh, I think we also still want to push to even higher redshifts. We want to study supermassive black hole growth in the first galaxies out at redshifts of 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and maybe even beyond. And we'd like to push beyond that and, and study, in fact, the seeds of the, the supermassive black holes in the early universe, pushing, again, out to redshifts of like 10 to 15, where you would see... The, the, the sort of uh, low mass and middle mass systems that actually grew to form the powerful quasars that have primarily been studied out in the distant universe. Uh, we also, I still think, need to develop a deeper understanding of AGN galaxy and AGN large scale structure connections. There have been real advances there recently, but I think a lot more work remains to be done. And, and we also still need to complete our understanding of AGN obscuration. And we'll hear about that more from, from some of the other speakers. So fortunately, we have a lot of powerful wide field AGN surveys coming. This is a, a little schematic that I made that just shows um, you know, some of the upcoming uh, radio and infrared and optical and um, X-ray surveys that are upcoming. And here are little pictures showing some of the, 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 the big things that, that, that are upcoming. And, um, Current estimates indicate that uh, together, when you combine together the data from all these surveys together, and we've done this from an LSST perspective, but other people have done it from other perspectives, that um, we, we hope to select something like 50 to 100 million or more reliable active galactic nuclei spanning all the way from low redshifts out to the very highest redshifts redshifts hopefully of 9 to 10 we might reach in fairly small numbers, but we hope to reach out to those redshifts. And then we will have this, this truly spectacular sample of active galactic nuclei that can very powerfully address all sorts of fascinating questions about black hole growth in the universe. Um, there are also, in addition to all of these, which are primarily wide field surveys, we also have a lot of fantastically powerful deep field uh, AGN survey facilities coming. And these, of course, will be essential for faint source science, for example, at the highest redshifts. And these will also be essential follow-up facilities for subsets of the AGNs that have been found in the wide field surveys, as, of course, is the case today. That will continue to be the case into the future. And again, these range from, again, uh, sensitive radio surveys through to uh, the, the infrared. The James Webb Space Telescope should be extremely powerful in, in, in this regime. 
um, new instrumentation on the VLT and other facilities will be very powerful. Of course, extremely large telescopes will advance our ability to do spectroscopic redshifts and spectroscopic classifications. And then, you know, future very powerful X-ray facilities will also be essential for, again, uh, exploring um, you know, obscured systems with a very high level of completeness and reliability. Um, I think with all these surveys that, that are coming along, there's going to be an enormous need for AGN spectra. As I've alluded to throughout this talk, this has been a major rate limiting step for much AGN science. We can generate enormous great samples of radio selected AGNs and X-ray selected AGNs and so on. But um, <clears throat> you know, getting the redshifts has persistently remained a rate limiting step despite their relative affordability. That is, you know, we have in some cases multi-billion dollar space missions and the ability to get science out of those missions is hung up just by the ability to get spectra of the sources that these multi-billion dollar missions have detected. And so I think a better investment in, in, in this regard could greatly improve uh, the return from, from many, uh, you know, frontier and, and costly uh, space missions. Thankfully, of course, uh, photometric redshifts, especially with the, the amazing multi-wavelength data that, that, that are coming, and narrowband photometric surveys will, will help in, in those regards. Um, and then finally, I just want to end by talking about the need not only to design surveys to answer pre-specified questions, but you also want surveys that just go out and explore a large amount of discovery space so that you will find new unexpected AGN phenomena. Nature has always proved to be cleverer than, than we are. And so yeah, making sure that you don't just design surveys too strictly only to explore um, you know, what you're expecting is, is crucially important. I think we are doing a solid job both now and in, with the plan facilities of filling uh, the discovery space. That is especially is the case, you know, considering the growing financial challenges in, in many nations. Um, and, uh, you know, if you consider, for example, the discovery space of wavelength and flux limit and time, where of course there's now ex an exploding industry of time domain surveys, uh, as well as spectra resolution and polarization, we're doing pretty well. I do think there is room for significant improvement, as I just said, in, you know, spectra as well as perhaps in polarization studies, if a compelling case can be found there. Um, and so, again, hopefully uh, the international uh, communities, maybe Ethiopia soon, can start to contribute in a large way in, in these regards and can hope, help us to fill this parameter space. Uh, and finally, I will just say that uh, an, another final point is that um, I think space missions, I think, still need uh, real progress in wide field surveys. One way of appreciating that is just to look at the ratio of depths uh, that, that various surveys in different bands have achieved. In the optical, for example, if you look at the, the deepest survey, the Hubble Space Telescope Ultra Deep Field Survey, and you compare that to the depth of a very wide field survey, for example, the Dark Energy Survey, it's only about 100 times deeper, okay? The Hubble Ultra Deep Field compared to the, the very wide field surveys now. Um, Currently, in the X-ray band, that same ratio, if you look at the ratio of the Chandra deep field depth to the ratio of, for example, the depth of the Rosat All-Sky Survey, that ratio is like 40,000. So there's a notable discrepancy there. And I think anything one can do to even up uh, the ratio to make the space wide field missions um, more competitive with the, um, the, the ground-based uh, facilities would, would be very valuable. Now, E-Rosita, for example, will help a great deal in that regard. After E. Rosita is done, that ratio will only be about 1,500, okay? So it'll be better. It still won't be as good as we have currently. And, and moreover, I would note that on the same time that E. Rosita will be doing its stuff, LSST will come along, and that will erode the optical ratio down to 10. And so it seems, of course, inevitable that, that the ground-based facilities are always going to outpace the space-based facilities, but anything that the space-based people can do to uh, keep that ratio more uniform, I think will be of, of great benefit for multi-wavelength AGN surveys. Um, I will end just by uh, giving here uh, a few recent reviews that I utilized to uh, prepare this talk. These were very helpful to me. People have uh, put in an enormous effort to write these, these uh, literature reviews. And these, of course, provide uh, references uh, to the enormous literature that's out there that can get people who want to learn more started 
in, in digging deeper to, to what we know. When clearly, again, in this talk, I've just been able to skim the surface of the enormous uh, work that has been done in multi-wavelength AGN surveys. And with that, I will end. And uh, thank you very much. Bye.